Open your Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1. And I know you're already thinking of last week's sermon by Chris Canuel, our guest last week, uh, pastor of Cheerful Hope, whom we partner with. And I, I, he did not know at that time that I was going to begin preaching through the book of Philippians when he went to chapter 4. But that's okay. If you still remember anything about chapter 4 by the time we get there, then I'll just play his sermon on the screens from then. And it was a great sermon. It really was. I think it's very timely and needed at the time. And his sermon was about peace and joy. And that is indeed what the entire book of Philippians is about. So today will be a brief, somewhat of an introduction. Next week we'll get more into the background of the writing of the book of Philippians. So you can understand the context very well and understand the setting. And that will help us to grasp the meaning of the book. Today we're just going to look simply at servants, saints, and the Savior. And in the middle of all of that, the core of those three things is joy. And if there is one thing, I think I can safely say this, if there is one thing this entire world is missing out on, it is joy. And people are looking in every way and from every facet, every possible way they can to find joy, and they're struggling to find it. They invest in so many different things, but they're still joyless. Now, we're still going to use this idea of excelling. We've been talking about that, excelling individually and as a church, being excellent in every way. But the one way you can be excellent in your life as a believer is to have genuine joy. We're going to see today how genuine joy comes from, from Christ himself. So if you would stand out of honor and respect for the Word of God... Philippians chapter 1, oftentimes the introductions to these books are overlooked and we don't want to do that because it is chock full of, of theology and, and truth. So just the first two verses. Paul and Timothy, servants, willing slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, would you add your blessing to the reading of your word and now the proclamation of your word. Father, help us to understand the privilege we have of sitting under the proclamation of your word. It is the bread of life. Help us to, uh, through your Holy Spirit, to grasp what is proclaimed, what is taught, what is read. Help us to... Write it upon the tablets of our hearts, Lord. Seal it in our hearts and our minds for your glory and our good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. So let's just talk briefly today about these three things centered in joy. Servants, saints, and the Savior. We talk often about in the world about how to get to the top, how to find peace and that kind of thing, and so often in the world, the world thinks it is to get to the top. But in Scripture, and we spoke of this Wednesday night in our Bible study, God takes the things of the world and flips them upside down. The things that the world or people in the world think are important, God just says, no, that's not important, and He flips it upside down. He, take, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He uses the weak things of the world to confound the strong. This is the way God does things. And boy, are we hit with this, this idea right at the very beginning of the book of Philippians. So this is a letter written by Paul while he was in prison to the church at Philippi. A letter. Just think about this church getting this letter and reading it, the pastor reading it to his people. And to know that Paul was in prison and these words were coming from him. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Servants of Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about this word servant because it is absolutely vital to our understanding of joy. How do we obtain joy? What is joy? And all of that. And believe it or not, the word servant is all over that. It is tied to the word joy. This word servant is literally the word in Greek, doulos. And it means this. Do your best to grasp this definition. Someone who belongs to another. I'm not done with this definition, but already our understanding of joy is getting twisted. You're thinking someone that belongs to another gives us joy? 
someone who belongs to another, a bond slave, listen to this, without any ownership rights of their own. Now this is how Paul and Timothy, his son in the ministry, are describing themselves. And they're filled with joy. He is in prison, yet he's filled with joy. So he's writing this letter to them, and he describes himself as someone without any ownership rights of his own. And it goes on, this definition. Ironically, it is used with the highest dignity in the New Testament. Namely, of believers who willingly live under Christ's authority as his devoted followers. This is how the Apostle Paul, this brilliant theologian, this brilliant missionary, this is how this brilliant teacher described himself and his son in the ministry, Timothy as willing slaves who have no rights of their own. They belong to somebody else, and they do this willingly. Again, how Paul and Timothy are described. And I think it's extremely important for us in our day, in the church setting, to remember that they did not strive to be stars. Boy, do we see that in our day, in the church setting. I, I, it, it blows me away to turn television on at times and, and even to go in different settings and see what, what church is like now at different times. How many people are striving to be superstars in the church. Of all places, that does not make sense. And Paul didn't have that, that ideology at all. I mean, here he was in prison. He didn't have to be. He could have arranged his ministry in a way to where he could have been a superstar. He had all of what it took. He had the brilliance and that kind of thing to be really exalted. But here he is in prison because of the gospel, because of preaching the word of God, because of holding to faith in Christ Jesus. And then he acknowledges that he is nobody. He has no rights at all from that perspective. He didn't try to be a star. He didn't have an attitude of, we're better than you. Nowhere do we see in his writings, Paul and Timothy are, this is the hierarchy, and we're up here, and your poor peons are down here somewhere, and we're going to grace you by sending you a letter. Nothing like that at all. He was, here's this brilliant man of God, this theologian, missionary, and the, the apostle, and Timothy, his son in the ministry, Paul in prison, writing to them, saying, I am nothing. I, I'm here with you. I, I'm no better than you at all. We're, we're not superstars. We're not VIPs. If you all want to ever see something absolutely amazing, go with me sometime, with me and Caleb, to the Southern Baptist Convention. Or even the North Carolina State Baptist Convention. You will see things that will amaze you. You all have been to a zoo before. It's very similar. <laughs> now, I'm not knocking that. I, I love what our convention does in so many ways. But at a zoo, you will see things such as peacocks walking around with their feathers out, and they're, they're showing the world that they are somebody. This is not what Paul is doing at all. It's just the opposite. Now, from our perspective, he had every right to, to do that. But he did not. He said, I have no rights of my own. I'm a willing slave. I'm a bond slave. Do, do, do you see this? Yet Paul was the same one in the book of Philippians that said, Rejoice, rejoice, be filled with joy. They were willing slaves. And listen, guys and gals, what I've just described, even, even briefly up to this point, this is joy. You can never... And the world does not understand this at all. They, they, they think, the world thinks that being on top brings joy. That you have to scratch and do whatever you can to get to the top, and that will bring peace and joy. But look at the world. The world has no joy. I can safely say that. Safely say that. And if for some odd reason you disagree with me, please just go home and turn the television on. It is a mess. I've honestly gotten to where I don't even watch it anymore. I, I used to be able to find some, some good preaching on Sunday mornings. Now I can't even find that. So I watched the real McCoys this morning while I was getting ready. 
Because you can't watch the news. There's no joy there. None. But Paul had it. And Paul was a willing slave. Paul had everything it took to be on the top, to be a very important pastor, whatever, <laughs> however you want to describe that. But he called himself a willing slave. Now, this entire book is woven together with this attitude that Paul had. This idea of becoming a willing slave, giving things up to have joy. Giving away your rights to have joy. And so often this happens to the church where we just all have to be right. From the pastor to everybody, we have to have our individual rights and we have to have our say-so and we have to be right and we have to prove what, what we know and how much we've done and all of this kind of thing. And, and why is that? We, we don't have to do that. God knows who we are. We don't have to do that. That's, a, that's an idea of the world. That's what the world uses to try and be important. And we in the church should not have to do that. Again, woven through this book is the idea that Paul had of being humble. I want you to look ahead briefly in the book of Philippians to chapter 2. I believe this is the heartbeat of Scripture right here. And it's speaking of Jesus. Paul goes into this incredible treatise of Christology, of telling us who Christ is and what he did. So if there's any encouragement there in verse 1, any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in, of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility, listen to this, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Here's our example now. Have, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, he's focusing on Christ now. He's about to tell us what Jesus did, how Jesus epitomized the humility who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. This is what Paul is talking about. Everything Paul says in verses 1 and 2 by describing himself as a servant, a doulos, a willing slave with no rights, is because of what we just read. This is how he does it. It is in Christ, but we're leading up to that. I want you to see this. He says, let, let's, read, let's go back to chapter 1 and, and verse 1 and, and going into verse 2. Paul and Timothy, servants, bond slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, listen to this, with the overseers and deacons. So we've already, we've already planted the, uh, uh, built the foundation of the humility in Christ. So this is how this is accomplished. And notice how Paul goes on to describe that he is not this VIP kind of person. He's very important in one sense, but he doesn't describe himself like this or doesn't act upon this in so many ways. He says to all, all the saints, the overseers and deacons, but he doesn't just describe them. He says with the overseers and deacons. Folks, I think this is vitally important. You know what Paul could have done? He could have, he, could have, he could have said, look, bow down to me because I am an apostle. And there is a hierarchy here, and I am right smack at the top of it. And you all better do what I say, when I say, and how I say to do it. And this is what we see so often even in Christian circles, and it is absolutely and utterly ungodly. We just don't see that in Scripture. Nowhere. Look, we just described... God himself who came from the glories of heaven and humbled himself to come to this earth to save our worthless souls. <laughs> How on earth could any human being become haughty and conceited? So Paul doesn't do this at all. He says, with the overseers, 
overseers and deacons, with the other pastors and with the deacons. It's together that we do our ministry. There's no hierarchy in the church. Yes, there's different roles. And God has, has clearly defined those and expects us to do those roles in the way that he has defined them. But there's no hierarchy except Jesus is Lord of Lords. He is above all. He is the head of the church. If Paul can say that, we can too. Paul and Timothy are not over the deacons and the pastors and the saints, but with them. Folks, we are in this together. It's not about getting famous. It's not about getting paid. It's not about getting power. It's not about any of that stuff. All of this that we're doing is about exalting Jesus. About making our Lord Jesus, the one that humbled himself and came to this earth for his glory and our good, it's about making him known throughout this entire world. It's not about making ourselves known. And true joy comes from that alone. If Paul and Timothy could do this, we certainly can. Our lives as believers should be constantly and totally surrendered to lifting up the name of Jesus. And whatever it takes, however low we have to get to lift up Jesus, then that is what it should be. To be a servant to surrender as Paul did, as Timothy did. Not be worried about getting your rights, having your rights, or being known, or getting uh, uh, rich, or powerful, any of that. Simply about making Jesus known. This is what brings real joy. And you've heard the acrostic before. Joy, Jesus, others, and you. And there's really a lot to that. Isn't there? It, there really genuinely is. You point people to Jesus. You put others above yourself. And joy comes from that. And we're beginning to see this even in the introduction of Philippians. So that's briefly about the, saint, the servants. Let's look at the saints. He goes on to say, to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Now this word saint, to me, is extremely interesting. The word is hagios, which means holy. This is how... People that are in Christ are described. Now, I know in our world that the word saints has been, has been kind of perverted and not used correctly. As a matter of fact, it's not even used in the church anymore. We hardly call ourselves saints, and that's wrong. For Scripture itself calls us saints. And do you know this? That in Scripture, before you're in Christ, before you've trusted Jesus, you're identified as a sinner. Not only what you do, but who you are. But after you've trusted Christ in Scripture, you're never called a sinner again. You're called a saint. Holy. Set apart for the glory of God. That's who we are in Christ. It's not that we're sinless. It's not that, that we're the ones that deserve the glory at all. And we know that. All the glory goes to Jesus, right? For He is the one that placed His righteousness upon us and set us apart. We can't take glory for any of that. Nevertheless, we are set apart in Christ. And this brings us joy. Let me describe the definition of this word hagios or saints. It's di it literally means this, different from the world, like the Lord. There's more to it, but, but listen to that. Different from the world and like the Lord. You see how... Why there's a different word for it? Why it means set apart? Different from the world and like the Lord. So my point in pointing this out is this. This is where joy comes from. The world is searching for it, but they're not searching for it in Christ. And they, that is the only place it comes from. Joy is being different from this world and being like Christ. So let me simply ask you today. If you're not in Christ, if you never trusted Jesus, if you've never been saved, how are you trying to find joy? What are the steps you're taking to try and find peace and joy in your life? Is it through your bank account or is it through some type of relationship or, or is it through trying to work your way to a relationship with God? Or is it anything like that? I'm telling you folks, unless you are set apart... There is no joy. 
I can flatly say that. Unless you are set apart in Christ, you will never find joy. I don't care how hard you work, what you do, how often you do it, any of that. Joy is found in being set apart. What about you as a believer? Have you gotten your eyes off of Jesus? Are, are you trying to, to find some joy in somehow uh, uh, in other things? Have you gotten to the place in your life where you're trying to get above other people, trying to make yourself known, have your rights, and all of that kind of thing? Folks, that is a dead-end road. You will never, ever find complete and utter joy till Jesus is your everything and you put Him above everything and others above yourself. Being set apart. Being a willing slave and being set apart. So how on earth is this done? This is, brings us to our third thing. Servants, saints, and finally the Savior. Look at verse 2. This is the gospel. You, you may look at it simply as an introduction to a letter to a church in Philippi, but it is much more than that. It is the gospel. For we've looked at joy in being a servant. We've looked at joy in being a saint. How is all that done? In verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He mentions these two amazing words, grace and peace. Where would we be without the grace of God? We would be in eternal punishment from the wrath of God for eternity. We'd be hopeless without grace. So what is grace? Grace is giving God giving us things we do not deserve. Grace is unmerited favor. We don't, there's not a person among us that deserves what happened in chapter 2 of Philippians, of God coming to this earth, humbling himself, and coming to this earth on our behalf. None of us deserve that, yet He did it. So we could become holy, set apart, and have joy. And you see, He ties grace and peace together. So God giving us things we don't deserve, which is Jesus, which is holiness. And from that, naturally flows peace and joy. Found in God through Christ alone. This is the only way. The world searches, as we said at the beginning, for joy and peace in so many ways, but it will never be found in nothing outside of grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have been providentially brought into this place on this day, and you've never trusted in Jesus. You're looking for joy. Maybe you've come to the place in your life where you've looked in every other place and nothing has worked and it's not going to. God has brought you to this place not by accident. You are here by design of the sovereign God to hear that joy is found in Christ alone. And only in Him. So I challenge, I encourage you to simply trust Jesus. To surrender your life to Jesus. If you never have, why not now? Scripture is so very crystal clear on joy. It's found in Christ alone. Even in the introduction of this letter. Today, if you are a believer, but somehow you've gotten your eyes on the things of this world, folks, this world is so fleeting. It is so temporary. It is so short. Don't waste your life on temporal things. Find joy in Christ alone. Whatever that means. And I, I understand the older you get, to me anyhow the more the things of the world tend to, you tend to see them for what they are. They're fleeting. You don't want the same things that you used to want, you know. But still, our eyes can get so quickly taken off of Jesus and onto the things of the world. Don't let that happen. Right now, every one of us ought to re-examine our lives to see where we are. Are we joyful? Are we joyful when all these tragic things happen? doesn't mean we don't grieve, but are we still joyful? And that can only happen when we are fixated 
on Jesus. When Jesus is our everything, and I could not mean that more. When He is our everything. Remember, Paul, this man was, <laughs> had gone through so much, was in prison when he wrote these letters, so many of them. In prison, folks, for preaching the gospel. Most of the pastors in our day, and probably including myself, would be there whining, writing a senator to try to figure out how to get out of this mess. Help me out. I've got my rights. Get me out of here. Paul understood that's not where his joy is. His joy was in using that situation, focusing on Jesus, being surrendered completely and utterly to Jesus, putting others above himself, and pointing others to the same thing. And as I say so often, do you think he regrets it now? <laughs> Not for a moment. So let's examine ourselves and see where we are. And are you joyful? Nothing is better than being joyful. And here's how it, does, how it happens. By becoming a servant, a willing slave. By being a saint, being set apart in Christ, who is our Savior. That is the invitation today. If you've never trusted Him, would you today? And we can help you with that. Would you, would you re-up your joy today? <laughs> by focusing on Jesus. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you for this letter, how our world needs joy on this day so desperately. And they're looking at so many wrong places. Father, I pray that the church will not pattern themselves after the world and look for joy in the wrong places, but that we will keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We know, we know that our joy comes from Him. So I pray, Father, right now that if there are any among us who have sought for joy in other places and have miserably failed, then I pray today they'll place their trust in Jesus. They'll run to Jesus. They'll look unto Christ. And Lord, if there are any believers among us who have gotten their eyes off of you, then, Lord, help us in that. I pray that your Holy Spirit will bring a deep conviction upon us for that, and may we look unto Jesus again and immerse our, ourselves in Christ so we will have joy and that the world can see that in us. And I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.